Thank you, Mr. Schiff, Chairman McCaskill, Vice Chairman Hatch, members of the committee. Now let me turn to uh, the facts that we shall prove in the case in more detail. Judge Porteous was born in December 1946, and he will be 64 this December. In 1971, he graduated from LSU Law School, and he was a partner with Jacob Amato, with whom you will hear later today between 1973 and 1974. Robert Creeley, who you will also hear from later today, also practiced at that law firm. From October 1973 to August 1984, Judge Porteous also served as an assistant district attorney in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. In August 1984, Judge Porteous was elected and served as a state district court judge on the 24th Judicial District Court for Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, where he served as a state judge from August 1984 to October 28, 1994. While a state judge, Amato and Creeley regularly and frequently took him to lunch and provided and paid for other entertainment for Judge Porteous. Judge Porteous virtually never paid for any lunches he attended with Creeley or Amato. Let me first start off by talking about Judge Porteous' curatorship scheme with attorneys Creeley and Amato. As Mr. Schiff stated, at some point after he became a state judge, Judge Porteous began to request money from Robert Creeley. The evidence will show that Judge Porteous claimed that he needed money for personal reasons, such as tuition, car repairs, or home repairs. Creeley would give him the monies as requested. Over time, as Judge Porteous' request for money persisted and the amounts he sought increased, Creeley came to resent and resist them, to the point that Creeley would avoid Judge Porteous' phone calls. Creeley went so far as to tell Judge Porteous that he felt he was being taken advantage of. This committee has ruled that the transcripts from the Fifth Circuit and the House hearings are admissible, so I will quote here from what Creeley previously testified before the Fifth Circuit. Quote, I don't recall if I specifically told him that it was because of his lifestyle, but I told him that I, we could not continue giving him money. I couldn't continue giving him money. In light of Creeley's resistance, Judge Porteous came up with the following scheme. Judge Porteous used his judicial power to assign Creeley curatorships. These are appointments whereby Creeley would represent a missing party in a case, such as a case to clear title on a foreclosure, for which Creeley would receive a set fee of approximately $200 from the court. And after Creeley was paid for those curatorships, Judge Porteous requested from Creeley money constituting some portion of the curatorship fees. Again, Creeley testified in the Fifth Circuit. Question. Did Judge Porteous make a request of you after sending you curatorships for a portion of the fees that you were being paid by the court? Answer, yes, sir. Question, and how did that, how did he do that? Answer, I don't recall how it came about, but it came about, and he got, and I can't, I can't tell you that he got all of the curator fees that we generated, but he got a good portion of the fees that we generated from the curators. Creeley told his partner, Amato, that Judge Porteous was asking for money from the curatorships. Here's how Amato described this in his deposition of August 2 of this year in response to questioning by Judge Porteous' attorney. Question, was it your understanding that there was a connection between the money that was the cash that was given to Judge Porteous and the curatorships? Answer, at some point in time, yes. Question, and how did you reach that understanding? Answer. Bob Creeley came in my office one day, told me that Porteous was sending curatorships, and he wanted us to, you know, give him some money back. And I told him, this is going to wind up bad. And as you can see, Mr. Amato could not have been more prescient. Now let me pause here. The evidence here is not simply the testimony of Creeley and Amato. Judge Porteous himself has admitted essential aspects of this sequence of events leading to and including his actions regarding the curatorships. For example, in his testimony under oath to the Fifth Circuit, Judge Porteous confirmed that Mr. Creeley refused to pay him money before the curatorship started. Answer, he may have said I needed to get my finances under control. Yeah. Similarly, Judge Porteous confirmed that during the time he sent curatorships over to the Amato and Creeley firm, he would receive money back from them. Question, after receiving curatorships, Mr. Mrs. Creeley and or Amato and or their law firm would give you money, correct? Answer, occasionally. Question, 
during the time you were giving Creeley and Amato and the law firm curatorships and you were getting cash back, was that cash you received a kickback for the curatorship in your mind? Answer, no, sir. Though Judge Porteous disputes whether the arrangement should be characterized as a kickback, he does not dispute the fundamental premise of the arrangement that was then in place, that there was a time that he was giving, quote, Creeley and Amato and their law firm curatorships and was getting cash back. Thus, Creeley and Amato acceded to Judge Porteous' requests and gave him cash that was funded by the curatorships. Creeley and Amato took equal draws from the firm to come up with the cash to give Judge Porteous in response to his demands. Here are examples of orders that Judge Porteous signed assigning a curatorship to Creeley, orders that Judge Porteous signed in his judicial capacity in order to enrich himself. During the 1988 to 1994 time periods, the House has identified approximately 200 curatorships that Judge Porteous assigned Creeley, amounting to fees of close to $40,000 to the firm. Creeley and Amato have each estimated that they collectively gave Judge Porteous approximately $20,000 or $10,000 each from the curatorship proceeds. And as to money amounts he received, Judge Porteous had testified. Question, Judge Porteous, over the years, how much cash have you received from Jake Amato and Bob Creeley or their law firm? Answer, I have no earthly idea. Question, it could have been $10,000 or more. Isn't that right? Answer, again, you're asking me to speculate. I have no idea is all I can tell you. Though the money came direct from Creeley, the evidence will show that Judge Porteous well understood that the money was 50-50 from Amato as well. The evidence will be clear that Judge Porteous spent time with both men and understood they had a classic partnership relationship. However, after Judge Porteous became a federal judge in 1994, his ability to assign Creeley the curatorships came to an end, and thus his cash requests came to an end for the time being. We believe you will conclude that the fact that Judge Porteous stopped making cash requests at the same time he stopped assigning curatorships is powerful evidence that Judge Porteous understood that those two events would be inextricably interwoven. Now let me turn to Judge Porteous' handling of the Liljeburg case in federal court, a case where Amato was the attorney for one of the parties. In early 1996, Judge Porteous, now a federal judge, was assigned a complicated civil case involving the dispute between a hospital, LifeMark, and a company that was running a pharmacy at the hospital known collectively as the Liljeburg. Trial was set for early November 1996, and just six weeks prior to the date for trial, in late September 1996, the Liljeburg hired Mr. Amato and the law firm of Amato and Creeley and another of Porteous' close, very close friends, Leonard Levinson, to represent them at trial. As Mr. Schiff noted, LifeMark's counsel filed a motion to recuse Judge Porteous. LifeMark argued that the timing of known close friends of Judge Porteous entering this complex case raised suspicions about the integrity of the process. LifeMark's attorney, Joseph Mole, had no idea that Amato had in fact, in partnership with Creeley, given Judge Porteous close to $20,000 in cash. In October 1996, Judge Porteous conducted a hearing on LifeMark's recusal motion. It is worth going through what happens at that recusal hearing in a little bit of detail. At the recusal hearing, Judge Porteous described his relationship with Amato and Levinson as follows. Quote, if anyone wants to decide whether I'm a friend with Mr. Amato or Mr. Levinson, I will put that to rest. The answer is affirmative yes. Mr. Amato and I practiced law together probably 20 plus years ago. Judge Porteous further stated, quote, yes, Mr. Amato and Mr. Levinson are friends of mine. Have I ever been to either one of them's house? The answer is a definitive no. Have I gone along to lunch with them? The answer is a definitive yes. Have I been going to lunch with all the members of the bar? The answer is yes. In short, at the hearing, Judge Porteous portrayed his relationship with Amato as simply the same sort of unexceptional relationship that he would have had with any member of the bar limited to having, quote, gone to lunch with him. Even that is misleading because the evidence will show that Judge Porteous had in fact accepted hundreds of meals at expensive restaurants from Amato without reciprocating. More significantly, 
In describing his relationship with Amato, Judge Porteous makes no mention whatsoever of what really is the issue. That is, that he has received thousands of dollars in cash from Amato's judicial act by Judge Porteous for the Marcotte's benefit, and evidences the extent to which Judge Porteous was beholden to the Marcotte's. Now let me turn to Judge Porteous' confirmation as a federal judge. At some point in 1994, excuse me, <clears throat> at some point in 1994, Judge Porteous came under consideration to be appointed as a federal judge. Judge Porteous knew that if the White House and the Senate had found out about his relationships with either Creeley or the Marcotts, he would never be nominated, let alone confirmed. In the course of the background investigation and during the confirmation process, Judge Porteous was asked questions on no less than four occasions that would have logically called for his disclosure of his relation with Creeley and Amato and the Marcotts had he been truthful and forthcoming. First, at some time prior to July of 1994, Judge Porteous filled out a form referred to as the supplement to the SF-86. On that form is a question that goes to the very heart of the issue associated with the background process. I want to show you that question and answer to the I want to show that question and answer to the committee. In that form, Judge Porteous was asked, question, is there anything in your personal life that could be used by someone to coerce or blackmail you? Is there anything in your life that could cause an embarrassment to you or to the President if publicly known? If so, please provide full details. To which Judge Porteous answered, no. Judge Porteous signed that document under the penalties of false statements. Of course, the evidence will show that he knew of the facts I have described and thus knew that answer was false. The evidence will show that thereafter, on July 6 and July 8, Judge Porteous was interviewed by an FBI agent as part of the background check process. Judge Porteous was asked by the agent the same sort of questions and his answers were incorporated in a memorandum of the agent that summarized the interview. Let me again show you the exhibit. In the FBI write-up of that interview, Judge Porteous was recorded as saying that he was not concealing any activity or conduct that could be used to influence, pressure, coerce, or compromise him in any way, or that would impact negatively on the candidate's character, reputation, judgment, or discretion. After that interview, the FBI in New Orleans sent the background check to FBI headquarters in Washington, which reviewed the background check. Upon that review, they directed the agents to interview Judge Porteous a second time about a particular allegation that the FBI had received in 1993 that Judge Porteous had taken a bribe from an attorney to reduce the bond for an individual who had been arrested. This allegation did not implicate the Marcotts. So on August 18, the FBI returned and conducted a second in-person interview with Judge Porteous, probing possible illegal conduct on his part in connection with bond setting. Once again, the FBI rec records Judge Porteous as stating, quote, that he was unaware of anything in his background that might be the basis of attempted influence, pressure, coercion, or compromise, and or would impact negatively on his character, reputation, judgment, or discretion. Finally, on the United States Senate Committee on the Judiciary, uh, uh, the United States Senate Committee Judiciary sent Judge Porteous a questionnaire for judicial nominees. Again, I am showing you the document on the screen. In that questionnaire, Judge Porteous was asked the following question and gave the following answer. Please advise the committee of any unfavorable information that may affect your nomination. Answer, to the best of my knowledge, I do not know of any unfavorable information that may affect my nomination. The signature block is in the form of an affidavit that the information provided in the document is true and correct. Thus, on four occasions, Judge Porteous concealed the truth as to his relationships with Creeley and, the, and Amato and the Marcotts from the FBI and the Senate. In addition, the two men who Judge Porteous had been receiving things from, Creeley and Marcotte, were each interviewed by the FBI. Each made misleading or false statements designed to protect Judge Porteous. Now let me turn to an act undertaken by Judge Porteous during the time of the confirmation process that evidences first that Judge Porteous well knew that his relationship with Marcotte was corrupt, and second, that demonstrates that he wanted to conceal that relationship from the 
As I mentioned, Marcotte had an employee named Aubrey Wallace. Wallace had two felony convictions, a burglary conviction and a drug conviction for which he was on parole. In the summer of 1994, at around the time period of the confirmation, Marcotte went to Judge Porteous and asked him to set aside Wallace's burglary conviction to take the first step in getting rid of his felony convictions so that Wallace would ultimately be allowed to obtain a bail bonds license. The evidence will show that Judge Porteous told Marcotte that he would set Wallace's conviction aside, but only after the Senate had confirmed him. I would like to read an excerpt from Mr. Marcotte's testimony before the House Impeachment Task Force, which has been ruled admissible, that illuminates Judge Porteous' intent. Mr. Schiff, you mentioned that, with respect to Mr. Wallace, that Judge Porteous expressed a reservation about setting aside the conviction until his confirmation took place. Can you tell us a little bit about that conversation? You said you had to press him. Did he tell you why he was concerned it would affect his confirmation? Mr. Lewis Marcotte, because if anyone, if the newspaper grabbed hold, then he would be worried that it would interfere with him being his confirmation. Mr. Schiff, and can you tell us what his words were, as best you can recall, how he expressed to you his concern that things might become public? Mr. Lewis Marcotte, he said, Lewis, I am going to get Wallace to let Wallace Lewis, I am not going to let Wallace get in the way of me becoming a federal judge and getting appointed for the rest of his life to set aside his conviction. Wait until it happens, and then I'll do it. In short, with regard to Article 4, the evidence will show that Judge Porteous deliberately sought to conceal material information from the Senate and did so in a calculated manner precisely with the intent to confound the Senate in the exercise of its confirmation. The factual record confirms Marcotte's testimony. Judge Porteous did, in fact, wait until after he was confirmed by the Senate and before he was sworn in to set aside Wallace's conviction. <clears throat> Judge Porteous concerns that he expressed to Lewis Marcotte that if he set aside, that if the set aside were discovered, it might derail his nomination, appear to have been justified. The media picked up this conduct and reported that Judge Porteous had engaged in an unlawful act. By this time, however, Judge Porteous had secured his federal judgeship. After he became a federal judge, the Marcotte's relationship with Judge Porteous did not continue precisely as when he was a state judge. Judge Porteous could not do as much for the Marcotts, and they accordingly did less for him. They stopped taking care of his cars. They took him to lunch less frequently. However, even if the relationship slowed down, it did not come to an end. You will hear that Judge Porteous was influential with other state judges from the 24th JDC, where he had previously presided. Moreover, the Marcotts knew that it was useful to have a federal judge in their corner. So even when Judge Porteous was a federal judge, the Marcotts continued to take him to expensive lunches, especially where persons they sought to impress, state judges and businessmen, would be present. As but one example, the, ex the evidence will show that Judge Porteous vouched for the Marcotts with newly elected state judge Ronald Bodenheimer in or about 1999. Bodenheimer, who prior to Judge Porteous' intervention held the Marcotts in low regard, ended up forming the same sort of corrupt relationship with the Marcotts that Judge Porteous previously had with them, accepting meals, home repairs, and hospitality on various trips, and in return, setting bonds as they requested. Ultimately, Bodenheimer and state judge Alan Green went to jail for conduct that was substantially similar to that of Judge Porteous vis-a-vis -vis the Marcotts. Both Louis Marcotte and Lori Marcotte were also convicted of felony offenses for having given numerous state officials, including judges and law enforcement personnel, things of value. Thus, Article 2 alleges that while he was a state court judge in the 24th Judicial District Court in the state of Louisiana, and continuing while he was a federal judge in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Louisiana, Judge Porteous engaged in a corrupt relationship with bail bondsman Louis M. Marcotte III and his sister Lori Marcotte. It also alleges that as part of this corrupt relationship, Judge Porteous solicited and accepted numerous things of value, including meals, trips, home repairs, and car repairs for his personal use and benefit while at the same time taking official actions that benefited the Marcotts. 
And Article 4 charges that Judge Porteous, quote, knowingly made material false statements about his, fast, his past to both the United States Senate and to the Federal, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in order to obtain the office of United States District Court Judge. The last aspect of our case relates to Judge Porteous' bankruptcy while a federal judge, set forth in Article 3. Throughout the 1990s and into 2001, Judge Porteous' financial condition deteriorated, largely due to gambling at casinos, to the point that by 2001, when he filed for bankruptcy, he had over $190,000 in credit card debt. There are different ways that the evidence will describe his financial activities, but perhaps the most compelling is that his credit card statements from 1995 through 2000 reflect over $130,000 in gambling charges, and his bank statements from 1997 through 2000 reflect over $27,000 in cash withdrawals at casinos. In 2000, Judge Porteous met with bankruptcy attorney Claude Lightfoot about his financial predicament. The evidence will show that Judge Porteous did not tell Lightfoot at that time, or indeed at any time, that he gambled. They decided that Lightfoot would attempt to work out Judge Porteous' debts owed to his creditors, and then, if that failed, Judge Porteous would consider filing for bankruptcy. Lightfoot's attempts at a workout failed, and in or about February of 2001, Lightfoot and Porteous commenced preparing for Chapter 13 bankruptcy. In March of 2001, in the weeks and days immediately prior to filing for bankruptcy, the evidence will show that Judge Porteous undertook numerous actions to conceal assets, to conceal certain unsecured debts, and to structure his financial affairs so that he would be able to continue to gamble and obtain credit from casinos while in bankruptcy. First, as part of these efforts, Judge Porteous, in consultation with his attorney, agreed that he would file his bankruptcy petition under a false name. To further this plan, Judge Porteous obtained a post office box so that his initial petition would have neither his correct name or a readily identifiable address. He secured that post office box five days before he filed bankruptcy. Ultimately, on March 28, 2001, Judge Porteous filed for bankruptcy under the false name G.T. Ortis and with a post office box that Judge Porteous had obtained on March 23, 2001, listed as his address. Judge Porteous signed his petition twice, once under the representation, I declare under the penalty of perjury that the information provided in this petition is true and correct, the other over the type name G.T. Ortis. On April 9, 2001, Judge Porteous submitted a statement of financial affairs and numerous bankruptcy schedules. This time, they were filed under his true name. However, the evidence will show that they were false in numerous other ways, all reflecting his desire to conceal assets and gambling activities from the bankruptcy court and his creditors. I'm not going through all his false statements during the bankruptcy at this time, but I thought I would at least point out some to you. He knowingly failed to disclose that he had filed for a tax refund, claiming a $4,400 refund, even though the bankruptcy forms specifically inquire as to whether he filed for a tax reform. He checked that box, no. He knowingly failed to disclose that he had gambling losses within the prior year, even though the form specifically asked that question. In fact, he has admitted before the Fifth Circuit that he had gambling losses. He deliberately concealed casino debts he had incurred in the weeks prior to filing, even though the forms in various places would have required those to be disclosed. He reported his account balance in his checking account as, as $100, when the day prior to filing he had deposited $2,000 into the account. He deliberately concealed altogether a money market account that he regularly used in the past to pay gambling debts. And there are others we will establish during the trial. The single organizing principle that arranges this pattern of false statements is Judge Porteous' desire to conceal assets and to conceal his gambling so that he could gamble while in bankruptcy without interference from the court or the creditors or even his lawyer. At a hearing of creditors on May 9, 2001, Judge Porteous was asked under oath to vouch for the accuracy of his schedules, to which he testified falsely as follows. Bankruptcy trustee, everything here in, true, in here true and correct? 
Judge Porteous, yes. That statement, like so many of Judge Porteous' statements under, you will hear about during this proceeding, was false. That bankruptcy trustee also informed Judge Porteous that he was on a cash basis going forward. At the end of June 2001, Bankruptcy Judge William Greendike issued an order approving the Chapter 13 plan and specifically ordered Judge Porteous not to incur new debt without permission of the court. Notwithstanding Judge Greendike's order, Judge Porteous did incur debt. He applied for a credit card. More particularly, Judge Porteous continued to borrow from casinos without the court's permission. In some instances, he paid those casino debts back through the bank account that he concealed. In short, the evidence will show that he engaged in a pattern of deceitful activity designed to frustrate and confound the bankruptcy process. I know I've taken some time here, and I appreciate your attention. Now let me turn the podium back to Mr. Schiff.